Good evening. Welcome to Old North Church and uh, a particular warm welcome to uh, the revised Friends of the Prado. Uh, delighted to see that organization uh, reorganized. And uh, I was involved in the first iteration a number of years ago as we uh, tried to clean the Prado several times a year and uh, raised a good bit of money to trim the trees. Uh, our tree trimming uh, uh, expert in the congregation tells me we need to do that again, so um, we look forward to uh, working with the friends to uh, get that done probably next spring. Uh, delighted that you're showing such an interest in uh, the North Ends, uh, um, one of the North Ends most important parks, and certainly the North Ends most important statue. Uh, and, uh, so and we as Old North are invited to host events like this. Uh, so all of you, I know you are the real activists in the community. If you would uh, like to come and use this space uh, for your organization, please give me a call. Uh, we're delighted to open our doors to the community. Um, and now I want to inter uh, introduce the, uh, the moving force behind all this and uh, my uh, morning coffee buddy, Dave Kubiak. Thank you, Reverend. I greatly appreciate the Reverend being so generous in providing the space this evening, as well as the space later on for the reception, which is just outside the church. But I also thank him for holding my hand and providing comforting and reassuring words for the last almost three months that we've been preparing this event, as well as the event that we held two weeks ago on the Prado, which by all accounts was a great success. I am privileged and honored to be speaking for the second time in a historical landmark, a historic landmark, in a historic oratorical hall. The last time I spoke in one was in Thalo Hall, and that was 1996, when I made a presentation about combined sewer overflows. And as, as much as I know you wish I would uh, reprise that this evening, I have a different assignment, and that assignment was given to me by the North End Waterfront Residents Association, of which I am a member, and there's quite a few members of the audience tonight. And that assignment is based on our desire to bring back public attention and care and improvements to our neighborhood parks. And when we got into this, we were thinking of plants and benches and cleaning up and things like that that you usually do in the park. But our chairperson, Anne Pistorio, who's a tremendous force for the parks on the North End, very quickly let us know that it's really all about history. So we begin every monthly meeting of our North End Waterfront Residence Association Parks and Open Space Committee with the historical research that she found in the preceding month. And it turns out that every one of our parks has an amazing history, a history before it was a park, a history in life and how it became a park, and also a history since then as well. And I think you're going to get a flavor of that this evening. What I'm about to present is really um, a a work in progress, and there's a lot more historical research to do. There are a lot more discussions that we will have with the Boston Parks Department and the George Robert White Fund to bring about the improvements that are sorely needed at the Prado. The Prado looks great right now, but if you look closely, you realize it is, in fact, uh, almost 80 years old and it's starting to show it, and it needs some, some attention. This evening, there will be three presentations. I'll speak about the Prado, then our curator, Rebecca Reynolds, who is co-sponsored by the Cyrus Strong Art Museum, will speak about Darwin and his part of their statue, and then Alex Goldfeld, our neighborhood historian uh, and president of the North End Historical Society, will speak about the neighborhood history that is represented on the plaques that are within the Prado. So the Prado is much more than a park. It's also a historical monument. It tells 
history. Now, you might think that this could be any street in the North End, and this is about the 1920s. It is, in fact, Webster Avenue. Does anybody know where, well, except for Anne, who's got all the research, does anybody know where Webster Avenue is? Well, that's because it isn't anymore. To orient you, here is where we are right now, Old North Church. Here is the street behind it, Unity Street. And here's Hanover Street here. Running from Hanover up to Unity was Webster Street, Webster Place, actually. And off of it were many small alleys, many small streets. This was probably the most congested part of our neighborhood. Lots of tenements, lots of people living here up until the 1930s. Uh, another thing I'd like to do to get a sense of here is a little bit more orientation. The Christopher Columbus School did exist at that time. This is 1917, of course. And the Elliott School is located here over on North Bennett Street, as opposed to its present location about here on Child Street. But we'll get into that a little bit later on. A closer view of Webster Place, you get a better sense of all of the streets and alleys off of it. Here is Unity Terrace. Here is Canny Place. And it just so happens that Nellie Canny lived on Canny Place. Washington Place. These are streets that none of us have, has ever heard of. Oliver Court existed here. And many others in, in this area, which is now the Prado. And I also point out what's here called in this 1917 map the Bay State House which was also at different times called the Webster House, and it was a fairly large hotel. And just a few shots of Webster Avenue, El Alcoli Avenue, and some of the streets off of it, the tenement buildings, and the very old wooden homes that also existed in this area. Most of these shots are taken between the 1890s and the late 1920s, but it just gives you a sense of what was there before the Prado. Most of the residents after 1917 were Italian, as you can tell from the previous map that I showed and the ownership of those maps, with a scattering of some of the remaining Irish and Jewish families that were in the neighborhood. This is a shot looking down Webster Avenue from Unity Street, and you can see that it's protected from any kind of moving vehicles. A shot of Candy Place with Ellie Candy with Oliver Court. This is an alley. I've tried to locate it on the map. I'm not sure exactly which alley it is, but it's one of the alleys off the of Webster Place. And of course, none of this is just there. And here's a shot of the Webster House. So this is Hanover Street. This is the entrance to the Prado. This building sits right where the entrance to the Prado is. Here is Webster Place, and for some reason there's a sign over it. Next to it, an interesting restaurant here called the Oyster House, certainly not the Union Oyster House, maybe it was the Webster Oyster, the Oyster House, I'm not sure. These three buildings were eventually removed to make room for the fire station that now exists on, on Hanover Street. So it's quite an impressive building, unfortunately, it went into bankruptcy and disrepair, and finally the city took over the building. So it did not need then to be taken for the purposes of raising and replacing it with a, with a park. So we're back to the 1917 map, and the reason I'm coming back is just to be able to show you the transition from 1917 until 1935 when the Prado was constructed. And again, it's very, very tight. The reason that demolition took place in this area is, uh, there are several reasons. One is that the city feared that the tightness of the old wooden structures was, was ripe 
for conflagration. And certainly, fire vehicles would not be able to reach the homes of these areas. At the same time, the city had been trying for decades to, and has succeeded for decades, in creating open space within the neighborhood. This neighborhood was so tight, not only with residents and tenement buildings, but also in, in industries along the edges of the North End, and even some, in some cases within the North End. So from the 1890s or so, right up until the 1930s, there was a program by different mayors at the time, spurred by Mayor Fitzgerald, Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy's father, who created the parks that now exist along, along the waterfront where the North End Beach used to be, the North End Pool, the Dutch Courts. So now there. He really started this, and other mayors picked up on it. About the time the buildings started to be removed here, they were also being removed between Morton and Stillman Street to create what is now Cutillo Park. And that's another park that, we, that our community is trying to put a lot of attention on as well. So this was happening all over the neighborhood, and it was seen as an improvement. And from what I've read, it seems that the neighborhood accepted this. Certainly, people were put out of buildings. There's no doubt about it. And, and, and I know that that's not a good thing. But personally, not that. But at the same time, I think people appreciated the fact that there would be areas where they could breathe, where they could have light, where, they, where their children could play. So the first demolition that took place along Webster took place not for the bridal, but took place to create a wider Webster Avenue and to create a playground for children. And that's what you see in the next map. At the time that this was created, obviously sometime between 1917 and 1928, there was no thought about a prior. I was thinking, well, maybe this was phase one towards the prior. No, as late as 1929, there was no thought about a prior. And as late as 1939, uh, Cyrus Allen was still thinking his more of his statue was going to end up on Copley. Company Square. So we see a, a lot of opening now, a very large playground, lots of light for these buildings, a playground for the kids as well. And there were also plans to widen many of the streets in the North End, including Webster Avenue, in order to provide enough room for vehicular and motor vehicle access. Even the, the narrow alley I live on, close by Cleveland Place, back in 1919, had a plan for removal of buildings and widening. I'm glad that didn't take place over there. Again, the Elliott School is still over on the corner of Wigan and North Penn Street to on the left. And then by 1930, in fact by 1935, we have a prior. So many more homes and streets were removed going from, sorry, going from 1928 to 1935, really. And where's the Elliott School? The Elliott School has been moved. The Elliott School has existed by that name and for that purpose, public school in the North End since 1700. And, it's, and it has had various locations. The location that you saw previously in this white area on the left, I believe, dates back to about the mid-1800s. And in 1933, it was relocated over to China Street, and you can see it there. And I don't doubt that part of the reason it was put there is part of the whole plan for the area to create wonderful kind of monumental buildings, which is what one would want to have around a child. The Prado was created so that it would provide sight lines and have the boundaries of St. Stephen's Church at one end and Oldham Church at the other end, and also having this brand new elementary school, public school on one side, I'm sure was a benefit to the vision of the Prado, the architectural vision of the, of the Prado. And that vision came from Mayor Curley. I am 
story is that we had Curly had gone to Havana, Cuba, and loved the Prado there, wanted to create something like that here. At the same time, of course, he was wanting to continue the work of Fitzgerald to create wonderful open spaces and to remove the blighted, dense tenement areas that they thought were so dangerous at the time. Also, creating the Prado would put people to work. And this was the early 1930s and the Depression. That was important. And finally, it was also a means for the mayor to uh, engender support among the Italian population in the North End as well. And that is because the initial purpose and vision for this park was a public park, a public gathering space. By the way, Mayor Curley was mayor for four terms, uh, none of them contiguous. So he was, uh, I think, the 41st, 43rd, 45th, and 48th mayor of of Boston, he was elected or re-elected mayor in his last term while he was in prison for corruption charges. He was also governor at one point and he was uh, a state representative early in his career. The real vision, uh, architectural vision and, and design <coughs> came from Arthur Shercliffe, very well known landscape architect from Boston lived in Boston his entire life, and he did such works as Williamsburg, Virginia, Sturbridge Village, redesigned portions of the Emerald Necklace, the Back Bay Fence, and, and other great, great works. His son, who was also a landscape architect and worked for his firm, the Shercliffe firm, which became Shercliffe and Shercliffe, his son's name was Sidney Nichols Shercliffe. He died in 1981. He wrote a book called The, the Day It Rained Fish. Did I get the title right now? Yes. The Day It Rained Fish, which is an amazing story about the creation of the Prado. And so I strongly recommend that you get a copy of that book at your library. The Day It Rained Fish by Sidney Nichols Shercliffe. And Arthur Shercliffe sought out the assistance of Henry Shepley, who worked for the firm that was the successor firm of H.H. H. Richardson in Boston. Shepley's father was actually an even uh, more prominent arch architect than, than Henry was. Um, but Henry was brought in for some of the architectural features of the new park. Cyrus we think probably didn't come along until the statue was erected in this space. Although we had a thought that maybe he was part of the creation of the Prado, thinking that someday he could put his father there, statue there. It kind of makes sense that, that he would want that and that he would work with his friends, Sherwood and Shepley. They all served on the Boston Art Commission and the State Art Commission. And so they all knew each other. But the more I read, the more it seems that he was not involved in the Prado, not directly anyway, and he was not planning to put his Palm Revere statue on the Prado. The Prado was created in 1935, finished in 1935. In 1939, uh, Dallin wrote his poem to, to urge the state legislature to approve the commission and erection of the statue at Copley Square, even then, 1939. And it was the legislature and the governor and others who decided to place the statue instead on what we call the Prado. And all of this was made possible, the statue and the park of the Jewish Rod White Fund, which was created in 1922. A request of $5 million from George Robert White. And I think this quote is important. And it's important because not only from this do we have some beautiful, wonderful parks and facilities in the city of Boston, but we also still have a fund that's going to continue to create beautiful, wonderful monuments and parks. And hopefully, 
uh, restore those facts. And we hope to be working with the Church Robert White, White Fund to restore the Prado to its original glory. The same can be held a permanent charitable fund to be known as the Church Robert White Fund, the net income only to be used for creating public utility and beauty and for the use and enjoyment of the inhabitants of the city of Boston. It is my intention that no part of said income, however, shall be used for a religious, political, educational, or any purpose which shall be the duty of the city of the ordinary course of events to provide. So obviously, he wanted to make sure that every penny of what he was leaving was going to be used to create something beautiful, something wonderful, something beyond what the city would normally do to bring benefits to its citizens. And here's the original plan layout of the Prado. Now, I counted on this plan and almost 80 linden trees. And that's more than I think you, you've said there. How many are there? About 40 of them now out there? 46 now. 46 now. Well, OK. I counted almost 80 uh, trees in the original. The original plan. And there are certain elements of this. In addition to the wonderful trees, of course, we have the fountain in the center that was designed for, to have very little maintenance, to be uh, pr protected from the cold, uh, from icing up that very shallow pool, protected from, being, from icing up, and uh, from any damage by vandals as well. There is a wall around most of the Prado, and that was intended to provide a very regular line. It's not a formality to the of the of the Prado, which would not have been necessary, say, in Europe with Prados, because those lines were provided by the monumental buildings around those spaces. Here we did have a few monumental buildings, and there are openings to those buildings on both ends and on the side facing the school, but the rest of it had to be walled off uh, to give it a more regular and more formal presence. I wanted to read something to you. So a continuous high brick wall, a continuous pavement of brick with piles of blue stone, a surface water drainage system, that drainage system I know from Combined sewer overflow studies drainage towards the end of the street. And it's been, that drainage, by the way, is treated very nicely with the Bear Island plant. Marginal seats of concrete along the walls, linden trees, as many as 80. The development, I love this, you will see on here that there is a garden at this location that was actually is actually, is actually part of the Prado. It is city of Boston property. It was created as part of the, pro of the Prado. At least two tenement buildings were taken down to create this wonderful, what was, what was a wonderful garden, but, but I love this description here. The development of a small garden near Christ Church, from which the exclusion of the public for many reasons is necessary. This exclusion being accomplished by a substan substantially built iron fence of agreeable design, through which glimpses of the garden may be enjoyed by passers-by. And we, I've actually seen photos of people looking into the closed gate of this space, and as you all know, this gate is, is now open. Posts and chains at both ends to prevent carts and motor vehicles from entering the Prado, and I, I said that the chains became a problem with injuring children who were swinging on them, and so at one point they were, they were fastened to the ground in a way that was not, I guess, aesthetically appealing. I have yet to go out there to see, to remember what the current configuration is, but it doesn't seem possible that children can now swing on them. And then there was the grand gate at the Elliott School, which makes me think even more that they wanted the Elliott School to enhance the formal, monumental feeling of this crowd. And here's an early photo. Here's the gate. 
that's locked. And the garden behind it, I'm not sure exactly what condition this is in. Maybe this is brand new and, uh, and the plantings and lawns have not yet uh, been established. You can see the many trees, total of nearly 80. And of course, now this is taken from the Old North Church, so obviously what was, what was very important for the creation of this garden was that sight line between the two churches. Now, how has it been used over the years? You're going to notice that most of these photos are old photos. Uh, and that's partly because if I took photos now, you would see just a lot of tourists. And I think you can offense to any of the who may be tourists out there. Uh, but what we hope to do is bring back, along with the wonderful tourists that visit every day, all through the year, we would love to bring back the I'd have to say former uses, uh, or at least former predominant uses. One was civic use, and here's an example of a parade grandstand set up and the beginnings of a parade taking place in the North I believe this was roughly in the 19, uh, 1940s. So there's that civic purpose to the product. There's a political purpose to the product. And usually you see a photo of Jack Kennedy in his first run for senator, I believe. But here's a photo of his, his uncle uh, with our good friend Mark Petrino as a little boy. And I can't tell you, I'm not sure which of the little boys is Mark and which is his brother. But Mark, Mark owns the Kana store, and that's not my accent, that's actually the spelling of it. On, on the corner of uh, Parliamentary Street and Hanover Street. He's a great guy. Uh, he's, he has, his family has some amazing photos all over the North End, but particularly in the crowd. And then there's quite a few photos here about the community use. The very first purpose, the primary purpose for this project was a community gathering place, a place of respite. And you will see that in these photos. And you will see that here, but not necessarily be able to see it by going out to the photo, unless you go out there early in the day or fairly late in the evening. I love to go out there early on Saturday or Sunday morning and read my newspaper. It's very quiet, except for a few tourists coming through. Uh, a lot of French-speaking tourists, and I love hearing that as well. But it's a wonderful place to sit when the weather's warm. <coughs> read your Saturday or Sunday paper. And obviously, the senior citizens enjoy being here as well, and you don't see many of them out there anymore either. When I first moved here 27 years ago, the senior citizens, even then, were completely lined up along the benches on the, on the walls of the prior. It was wonderful. And what you also see here is a plaque, a plaque that at least doesn't exist in the prior. I'm not sure if it exists at all. There were other plaques in front of, you know, Alex can speak to this, that and I, I don't know where they are today. This one certainly isn't there. And this was a plaque in honor of the part of the First Amendment, the right to petition. And I would love to see that plaque brought back, especially in this neighborhood, because we do love to petition our government. And more photos of the residents of the North End gathering and enjoying their park. Another reason for, for showing these is to be able to point out, be able to find things that don't exist anymore that probably should. And I believe that what we see here certainly looks like a flagpole. It's hard to believe that in this historical monument there is no flagpole. So maybe we need to bring that back. Uh, I also picked this photo because Anne has a bird when people play in the pond. Because there's no water here in the pond, so it's okay. Uh, another photo of people enjoying. Now, notice all of the residents sitting along, all the North Enders sitting along the benches along the walls. And this is what I remember as well from, from 27 years ago. But you'll also see here are what were supposed to be permanent, attractive, Cages for the trees, barriers for the trees, 
and I guess they did survive quite a long time. This one was in the 1950s, so for at least 50 years they were there. Of course, they're not there anymore. And let me make sure I didn't miss anything. Whoops. Ah, okay. And that brings me to today. I love these photos that were taken by our own Matt Conti. Fantastic photos because they give you a sense of how beautiful how monumental the Prado can and should be. And that's what we're hoping to bring back. And I think with the next couple of speakers, you'll get an even greater sense of the importance of, of this public park.